We're going through chapter by chapter the uh, book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, do, if, in case you were here last week, that was the longest message I preached this year. And so I will not go that long. I don't know exactly how much shorter I'll be, but it won't be that long. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a, a challenging chapter to tackle because there's three major things it addresses, and I can only deal with one of them. Uh, one of the things it addresses is marriage. And um, uh, I'm not going to spend time on that because actually last February we did a whole series on marriage called Unconditional. You can certainly access that online. We also did a, a marriage conference, and that material is available online as well, so I would, I would refer you to that. The second thing that Paul talks about is our work, our vocation. And I think it is one of the most fascinating uh, issues that he brings to our lives about how we find our identity, how we find our security, what work does for us, and what we bring to it. It's a fascinating topic. I'm not going to tackle that today. I have set that aside, though. I'm going to use that at some point in the future. Um, what I do want to talk today about is being single. Uh, that is also addressed significantly in this passage, and I realize I've not talked about this in a very, very long time. And in case you're worried now, you just sat here and you heard single and you're afraid I'm going to give the sex talk. Actually, when Paul talks about singles, he talks very little about sex. He talks more about sex when he talks about married people. So if the S word scares you, uh, you're almost out of uh, uh, problem today. Uh, Chris Rock the comedian says, or asks this question, do you want to be single and lonely or married and bored? <laughs> and some people think that's the only two options you have. John Mayer, in a song called Perfectly Lonely, put it this way, nothing to do, nowhere to be, a simple little kind of free, nothing to do, no one but me, and that's all I need. I'm perfectly lonely because I don't belong to anyone, and nobody belongs to me. Paul, when he begins to turn into chapter 7, actually changes his tone. Up to now, he's been very decisive in his language, almost disruptive in his willingness to address things. But when he gets into chapter 7, there's a complete change in his tone. Because now he's going to start addressing issues that are not just simply crystal clear or black and white. He's going to start talking about things that are a little bit more gray. And there are some people in the room right now, and you're going, yeah, that's not true. It's either black or it's white, and that's just how it is. And I wish that's how it was, because that would make my job a lot easier. But the simple truth is, I used to be a very black and white person but I kept getting run over by all the gray stuff in life. And I figured out I had to figure it out. And that's what Paul begins to do in this passage. He understands that there are issues that are complicated. Please understand this. The gospel is simple, but people are complicated. Our lives are complicated. And so we need deeper spiritual insight because there's not always a clear passage that says exactly what we're supposed to do with a situation. And we need pastoral guidance, someone who can walk that journey with us and help figure it out. And so the Apostle Paul turns this corner and he starts addressing this issue that we're going to look at today about singleness. And this is what he says. He says, now about virgins. And right away, everybody's going, oh, good. Now he's talking about sex again. And and this is a, a, it's, it's a very wide uh, term, and of, it actually included the concept of not being sexually active, but the concept was more about, I'm talking to the people who are not married, or even the people who are not married, but they're betrothed, they're engaged. He said, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, we should think about that. What is this present crisis? crisis. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not, what's the next word? So all you married people can breathe a sigh of relief this morning. And if a virgin marries, she has not, what's the next word? But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you of this. 
<laughs> I, I don't know if you heard that. Somebody said too late. <laughs> There are lots of singles that don't know this verse is in the Bible. Those who marry will face many troubles in life, and I want to spare you of this. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he's engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does what? <laughs> I know, you're sitting here going, say, what did I walk into? Some of you did not know these passages were in the Bible. Some of you just made a decision to start reading the Bible because you didn't know this stuff was in here. Uh, fascinating passage. I don't know if you noticed, it just happened. For the first time in our nation's history, singles are a majority. 50.2% of all adults, 50.2% are single. And that, in case you're wondering where that statistic comes from, it comes from the Bureau of Labor. Paul is addressing this issue about being married or single because there's great tensions on pressure to be married and pressure to be single in his culture as well as in ours. And we're going to see how that works out. What he wants us to know from the beginning, you probably noticed his language on this. Scripture teaches that when it comes to being single or being married, you are free to choose. You can decide. You can choose to be single. You can choose to be married. And in either case, you are not sinning. Now, what we do need to know is that back in Paul's day, there was something under Roman law, there was something called Augustan law, and Augustan law addressed issues of being married and unmarried. And if you were unmarried man or woman, this is important to know, whether you were an unmarried man or woman, if you were uh, unmarried, you were not allowed under law to receive the inheritance from your family. If a husband died, the wife or the widow was expected to remarry within one year or she would forfeit in the inheritance. If she was divorced, she was expected to remarry within six months or she would uh, uh, sign off on the inheritance and she would not receive it. So why did they do this? Because in the ancient world, marriage was the highest value. And there's reasons for that. The first reason is it's the source of your economic stability. In the ancient world, families built wealth over time. There wasn't as much opportunity as is available in our modern cultures today. Corinth was kind of an exception to that, and that created a, a different set of challenges. But in the ancient world, the way you built wealth was over time. Everybody kept adding to it, and you'd pass it along to the next generation. And if you passed it along to a single who might not marry, then they would have no one to pass it along to, and it would be forever lost to the family. And so they would use marriage as a way to advance economic stability, even in the selection of who you would marry. In the ancient world, they did not always marry who they thought was the most beautiful or who they uh, thought they were most in love with. Often, it was an economic decision. They would just marry the person that they thought would create a better economic situation for them. The second thing is that marriage was the source of their identity and meaning in life. It's where you found your sense of belonging and your sense of family. And in fact, women were not considered to be a, a very high status in the ancient world. An unmarried woman was even considered less. And so it was a very difficult situation for people if you were single in the ancient world. And there are lots of people who still think like Corinthians today. You might think that we've changed all of that, but if you think about it, it's not really so. There is often a stigma on being single. 
Singles can be frustrated that people always assume there's something wrong with them if they're on their own, if they're alone. Even the church can add a huge amount of pressure to a person who's single. Often single ministries, fortunately our church uh, tries not to do this, but often single ministries is an attempt just to get singles together so they can pair up and eventually find someone so they can get married and make the rest of us feel better about it. Even in churches, we have Mother's Day and we have Father's Day, but when was the last time we had Singles Day? So I've been talking to some people around here, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to have a Singles Day. I don't know what it's going to look like yet, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> Paul surprises us by saying that singleness is a valid option. In fact, in some cases, it might even be a better one. He tells us in verse 28 that getting married is not a sin. Why would he weigh in on this? Well, there were some interesting influences that were occurring in the Corinthian church. It was, it was a great culture collision. There were some people who were kind of hedonistic. By the way, if you were a, a husband or a male in Corinth, you were as likely to visit a prostitute on your way home from work as anyone today is likely to stop by for a drink or to have some ice cream on the way home. We have no appreciation for how far the boundaries have been spread on human sexuality. It was very much a hedonistic culture. And hedonism just basically separates the body and spirit and says that the body is neutral and do whatever you want. The response to that is that religious people become aesthetic. And aestheticism means that you have to punish yourself. And they were even telling some people that if you're married, that's a sin. And you have to stop having sex within your marriage or... You have to actually get divorced so that you can please the Lord with your spirit. And Paul just rails against that kind of thinking. In fact, that whole first passage about married people, he, goes, he addresses that specific issue. But what he's saying to us is that in modern cultures, there's this sense that we tend to think we're losing our freedom when we get married. And Paul will not take either extreme position. He will not say that marriage is the ultimate and that if you're single, you're out. And he will not take the position that being single is the ultimate. He says that either way you're not sinning, and either one is good, and in some cases one can be better than the other. Uh, by the way, I think the church could take a lot of wisdom just from his approach. We have a lot of very loud, angry, and fearful voices in our culture that constantly call us to the extremes of any issue. And the Apostle Paul, because he has spiritual insight and because he has a pastor's heart, he refuses to gravitate to the extremes of an issue, and he finds a way to navigate real life with the grace of God. So he won't take an extreme position. He says it's legitimate to be married, and it's legitimate to be single. And married people need to stop treating singleness like a disease. Don't do that anymore. Stop asking single people, so when are you getting married? Stop telling them you're not getting any younger. Don't say things like maybe if you lost some weight or you got yourself cleaned up. And by the way, singles, you're not completely off the hook here. You need to stop saying that marriage is just for needy people pairing up with each other because they can't make life on their own. All right? Those are both extremes we should avoid. Paul says, because of this present crisis, his, his admonition, his insight, his instruction begins out of this concept of crisis. What is the crisis? And some people think that he is referring to the end of the world. That is eschatology of believing that Christ is going to return and he's going to dissolve all things and then resolve all things. That that means he's saying, don't bother getting married because this whole thing is over in just a little bit. Then there's some people who think that he's actually referring to that region of the world was going through a famine at that time. And it was very difficult on individuals as well as families. But he, if you look at the context of this passage, he adds a little bit more information. This is really interesting. He says, what I mean, brothers and sisters is that the time is, what's the next word? Short. That word short doesn't mean that we're running out of time. That word is better translated, the time is critical. These are critical times. These are significant times. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it was not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form 
is passing away. This is a challenging passage. Is he actually saying married people should stop living like married people and we should stop buying things? That's not what he's saying. He says the world in its present form is passing away. It, the, the, the language here is the same kind of language as if someone were taking a mask off and you could see the real person underneath. That there's a lot of pretending that happens in the world. There's a lot of masks that people wear. And what he's saying is, is that because these are critical times, the masks are now coming off. And what he's telling us is, because of Christ's work on the cross of Calvary, that changed everything. He's not saying these things are bad. He's just saying they're not the ultimate things. These are not the most important things in your life any longer. You don't have to stop having a spouse. You don't have to stop dealing with the world. He doesn't say any of these things are bad. He just says they're not the ultimate things. They're good. We can enjoy them, but they're not everything, or they should not be to us. Once you've received Christ, we see things for what they are. The mask comes off. This present order of things is beginning to pass away. Now, singles have uh, some freedoms. Here's a freedom a single has. Singles are free to worry less. Singles are free to worry less. That's what he says in verse 32. I would like you to be free from concern. When you have a spouse, you get concern. It's just how it is. I cannot spare you from this. Okay? For example, I do a fair amount of traveling, and when I travel, my wife is concerned. First of all, she knows me really well, and she doesn't actually believe that I can make it home alone without her. Uh, she, you know, and sometimes I'll be in the car, and she'll be giving me detailed instructions, and I'll say, you must be surprised every time I find my way home. You know, just... <laughs> We get concerned. She's concerned that I might be in an accident. She's concerned I might, uh, my flights might be delayed, that I might miss a connection. There's all kinds of concern. Or if your spouse is coming home late, you might be concerned. You might be worried. Maybe something happened to them, or maybe this is going to disrupt their schedule significantly. And Paul actually goes on to say that the unmarried people have less concerns. He does say that they can be concerned for the things of the Lord, but it's true that a married person is concerned for more than just the things of the Lord. They also have to be concerned about how to please their spouse. And what Paul begins to instruct is that one of the things that pleases God is when we care for others, not just our family. We should care for our family, but not only our family. And when you're single, you actually have more freedom to do that. You see, a married person can't make unilateral decisions. If you come up today and we start talking, I can't just say, oh, why don't you come over to the house Tuesday about 8 o'clock? We'll have ice cream. I actually have to run that by my wife. And same thing for her. She doesn't just say, oh, yeah, well, why do we do that? Because it's not just two people living in the same space. The two have become one, and so the unilateral decision-making is something that, that you lose when you become married. You don't get to make decisions about how you spend your time or how you spend your resources on your own. You have to bring the other person into the equation. Now, married people are called to still love their neighbors, to still do good things. But here's the thing to understand about that. There are lots of people who hide behind their spouse so they don't have to do this. Oh, I wish I could, but the ball and chain. There's just kind of this thing, you know, they throw their spouse under the bus. And what you should know is uh, that's not an option, people. Either, that's not an option uh, either. Single people have obligations too, just less obligations. And we're surprised because there's actual social benefits for being single. There's not been a lot of study on this because almost all the study has been done to find the social benefits for being married. And by the way, the statistics are in. Over the course of your life, if you are married, you will actually do better financially in terms of obtaining wealth than if you are single. There's reasons behind that that I don't have time to go into. We actually talked about that in our marriage series. But this is what's fascinating. There are social benefits that are, that are uh, observable for being single. Young and middle-aged singles 
have moved into cities where you wouldn't necessarily bring families, and they spend their time there, and they meet with their friends there, and they have fun with their neighbors there, and they go to cafes and to restaurants, and they participate in social activities. Cities with a higher number of singles are actually seeing a thriving public culture because singles have more freedom. It's just how it is. This is because of the freedom you have when you are singles. But there's also some freedoms that we have to learn as singles. And the first is this. You have to learn to be free from social pressure. Learn to be free from social pressure. Corinth was a very ambitious and a very influential and a very materialistically wealthy city. In fact, it was one of the few places in the ancient world you could go and actually change your station in life rather rapidly instead of over generations. And many began to argue that marriage was actually not uh, something that you should personally aspire to, regardless of the law and regardless of the religious culture and regardless of the ancient world's culture. They began to say, it's just better to be single. And Corinthians were feeling the pressure from both sides. Society saying they should marry and younger, upwardly mobile people saying they should not marry. And Paul's argument is just simply this. He doesn't say one is better than the other. He just simply says this. Don't make the decision because of the pressure you feel. Decisions you make because of pressure usually wind up being poor decisions. It's unwise for singles to marry just because they feel the pressure to marry. It's unwise for married people to also surrender to the idea of social pressure. You know, we all, when we raise our children, we want them to be free of surrendering to peer pressure. But the reason they are so susceptible to it is not because of their age. It's because we model that as adults for them all their lives. It's astonishing how often peer pressure is used in church environments in order to control people's behavior. And Paul says, when you're making decisions based on pressure, you usually wind up making poor decisions. So being single, when you're single, uh, you can... Uh, Learn to make decisions that are not based on pressure. Here's another freedom you can learn. Singles can learn to be free from controlling desires. Paul talked about this. You have to learn to control your own will or to control your desires. Being single so you can love your neighbors, that's a good reason. But some people are single so they can focus on their career. I don't want someone slowing me down. Or some people are single because they hate the thought of being obligated to somebody else. They resent that. And some people are single because they're afraid that someone better might come along and they don't want to settle for the person that they're with right now. And what Paul would say is, these are not good reasons. He would tell us that at the root of it is just one more way for you to get what you want. And this is what he's telling us. Your desires are not under control. If the reason you're single is just to get more, then your desires are not under control. If you want to get married so that you can completely give yourself to a person, that's a good thing. But if you want to get married because you can't bear the thought of being alone, that's not a good reason. Or if you want to get married because you don't know who you are when you are alone, not a good reason. In those situations, your desires are not under control. Getting married for those reasons will always crush your spouse because you are asking them to give you your identity. You are asking them to help you never feel lonely. You are imposing upon them a burden that there's only one being in the entire universe that can carry the weight of, and that is God. You cannot put that on your spouse. You will crush them. And this is what happens in lots of relationships. We're looking for the person of our dreams. That should tell you right there you already have a problem because they don't exist. You had to dream them up. Okay? <laughs> but there is one whose love is better, better than being married, better than being single. And this love brings real freedom, freedom to the things that seek to control us. Even when he was being tortured, he does not stop loving you. Even when he is being beaten and slapped and whipped and spit, 
speared and spat on. He doesn't change his opinion of you, and he will not give up on you. He will not let you go, and he will not let you down. And once you've experienced that kind of love, it puts all the other kinds of love in perspective. If someone else lets you down, it's troubling, it's frustrating, it's disappointing, it even hurts, but it's not the end of your life because your life is in Christ. And that's what makes the difference. Singles can also learn to see their current situation as a gift, as a gift. Now, uh, if you've been around church world very long, you've heard about this gift of celibacy. And I've never heard anyone say they wanted it. And I don't think if anyone opened a package and that's what it was, they would go, oh, this is what I was hoping for. And there's a lot of problems with how we think about this because often people think about celibacy in terms of a lifetime commitment. That's not what it is. You have to know in the mind of Paul, when he thinks about sexual behavior, he always puts it in the context of the marriage relationship. So for him to be single is not to be sexually active. And what he wants us to know is that, of course, everyone has desires, and everyone wants their desires to be met. And if they're not being met right now, that's probably something you wouldn't have chosen for yourself. But what Paul wants you to know is that even when your desires are not being met, you can still be satisfied and content where you are whether you are single or married. By the way, just in case single people think that married people are always content, take it from a pastor who's done lots of marriage counseling. This is not the case. Whether you're single or married, you have experienced a love that is greater, a love that will never let you go, a love that will never let you down, and so that enables you to see the current situation differently. You see, some singles want to be married, and they're afraid of being married. You're afraid you might lose your freedom. You will. You're afraid you might miss out on something. You'll miss out on some things. You're afraid that someone will know the real you and then maybe reject you. Please remember you have one that knows you better than anyone else ever will, and he will never reject you. Last point, both singleness and marriage were meant to be gifts, not God's. In Christ, whatever situation you're in doesn't mean you're trapped in for life, but it also means that your current circumstance is not a trap. Wherever you are, you're able to bear witness of the grace of God and the good news that he offers to us. So here's the challenge. For lots of us, when we are in a situation we don't prefer, we often ask, how will God get me out of this situation? I'm going to give you a better question to ask. Here's a better question. How will God use me while I'm in this situation? That is how you find contentment and satisfaction. And then when you make the decision to marry, it will be for the right reasons. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, you might be here and just feel like, well, I mean, I probably wasted a little bit of time because I'm married. And, uh, just before you check out completely, um, let me share an, an unkind truth. And that is, it is likely at some point you will be single again. I wish it weren't so, but Accidents and disease and divorce take its toll at alarming rates in our culture. And this is what I want you to know. You can't find yourself in a situation that God will abandon you. And you can't find yourself in a situation where his love will not be greater than all the love around you. And you can't find yourself in a situation that he will not use you. Unless, of course, the thing you desire is the most important thing to you. All of these things are gifts meant to be enjoyed by God. 
They were never meant to be gods that would control our lives and be the ultimate thing to us. And as soon as we understand that, we actually begin to enjoy the gifts better. We appreciate them for what they are. And we also accept what they are not. So Father, help us today. Our culture has permeated our thinking on this so much that it's hard to see clearly. And there's so much pressure from all sides that it's hard to make wise choices. Will you help us gain the insight that Paul shared to those who were struggling with this very issue in Corinth? Would you help us see that whatever situation we're in, there's gifts you have for us and gifts you want to release through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.